He went there for undergrad. Went over to EVMS for med school and true to the adage that sort of every road in, in Virginia leads back to Charlottesville. He found his way back there for residency. Uh, spent some time there. Went up to uh, Mass General for uh, his fellowship with sports. I think you guys took care of some of the, the local athletes like Tom and, and Rob or uh, Brady and Gronk for, for the rest of us. And uh, he couldn't get enough of the hip and hip arthroscopy. So he went over to Nashville, did some work there. Um, and uh, he's, he sort of learned a lot about the anatomy, the physiology, hip arthroscopy. Um, and flash forward almost a decade, went back to Charlottesville. Uh, he's now the residency program director there and uh, chair of education. He's a team physician for, for the name in uh, ACC sports, go who's. Uh, and um, most relevant to us today, uh, he is approaching celebrity status in his uh, knowledge on, on hip, hip arthroscopy and, and the hip. So uh, the painful hip is like, you know, super, is, is extremely important and, and uh, very common in orthopedics. We see it all the time. Um, the pathology of the joint is myriad. And, and I, I don't know about you guys, but for, for me, there's sort of a lot of patients that fall somewhere in between uh, a normal hip and a hip that's ready for an arthroplasty that, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure how to, to handle or, or how to think about. So Dr. Watkins here, he's going to hopefully shed some light, uh, open our eyes and give us the tools to help us help our patients. Uh, he's going to let us know what, what we can do for people before we have to hand them over to our, our friends in adult recon joints guys. And, uh, um, he's been awarded countlessly uh, for his, you know, teaching and tenacity with, with education. Um, it's been a great mentor for me and uh, you guys, I, I, I hope you enjoy. So enough of me, Dr. Gwathney tells a, a tale of two hips. Thanks, Jeremiah. I just want to say thank you. This is a true honor for me to come. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so yeah, Jim Marr was one of my medical students back at UVA and I got to know him quite well. And so and, uh, we've still been in touch and he invited me to come down to speak to you all. I was, I mean, obviously I'm flattered and I'm, and I'm honored to be here. So I'm, I'm a hip guy at UVA. I also do, I do general sports as well. Um, and so I guess Jim Marr kind of told you a little bit about my road. And I think the students and the residents in the room need to realize that, um, you know, when you're trying to create a career for yourself, you have to kind of understand, you know, where the needs are. And so when I came out of residency back in 2011, there wasn't a lot of shoulder and knee jobs out there. And so um, these little niche things that have formed, you know, open shoulder, elbow, hips and stuff were, were kind of a way to get back into academics for me. And so it's actually kind of a serendipitous road for me because when I came back to UVA, I was like, yeah, we want you to come back. You know, you're a great, you know, you'd be great in a residency program. You'd be a good educator, but you have to be able to do hips. And I'm sitting here thinking like, man, I've never even seen a hip scope. I mean, and I saw, I saw one or two that I did a trauma guy had done. I was like, that was a complete thrash. Like, I can't believe you can even scope a hip. And so I try to design my fellowships around learning about hips and never over time, you know, the hip is basically I've succumbed to it. And uh, so now my goal as a faculty member at UVA is to try to demystify the hip joint from the standpoint of preservation and just kind of make it so it's not quite so fringe. You know, in the sports world, you have the shoulder and knee uh, surgeons and you have the hip surgeons that were kind of at the, at, the, at the kids table, if that makes sense. And so I think over the next 10, 15 years or so, it's going to become much more okay, part of the common practice for a sports medicine physician to be able to manage the hip stuff. So Currently, I'm the hip guy at UVA, so the, my partners don't have to worry about it. But I think as you guys, um, you know, come into your practices, I think it's going to be more and more kind of uh, mainstream. You have to understand this stuff. So, um, seeing as, uh, let's see if it's going to work. I'll make this easier, I think. There you go. So, my consultants, I think my main disclosure um, is that I am a hip arthroscopist. So, I do have a mild obsession with saving the hip. And so, um, so I think you'll see a lot of bias as far as how I talk about it. I know there's probably some joint replacement surgeons in the room who thinks that all hips meant, are meant to be replaced, but I'm going to try and prove to you that it's not necessarily the case. So my key objective is just kind of make this kind of fun. I'm not going to get too esoteric into the literature and things like that. I'm just going to try to give you an idea of the two main entities we see in hip preservation surgery. Um, in part, you know, I see a lot of students and residents in the room trying to give you some, some knowledge as best I can. So I'm um, uh, paying homage to Charles Dickens here. So Charles Dickens wrote a book called The Best uh, Tale of Two Cities. 
And it, it opens the best of times, the worst of times, wisdom, despair, hope, despair. And, it, and I was sitting there reading this, this book one day. I was like, this sounds just like an average day in my hip clinic, foolishness and despair and all that different kind of stuff. All you, if anybody been in the hip clinic, you can see some despair there. It's definitely kind of where there's a certain population of patients that tends to gravitate toward having labral tears in their hips. So I just want to let you know that. So I'm going to take that and kind of change it up a little bit and call it a tale of two hips. And so this is the book that I'm going to write. Okay. So the story begins with two athletes. This is actually, this actually happened one week, a couple of years ago. I had two athletes with labral tears and presented in my clinic um, with their trainers and, you know, labral tears of the hip are basically what I treat. And so the, the fact of the matter is not all labral tears are created equal. And so I'm going to try and explain to you is sort of the, the this, the environment behind these two tears. So I'm going to introduce two characters. Okay, my first character is Fred. My second character is Danny. These are their true names, but it's going to, there's, it makes it easier for me to keep the cases straight. Okay, so this is Fred. He's a Division One college soccer player. He presents the four month history of right groin pain and facial pain. So basically, pain kind of in the general area of the hip joint. The pain is exacerbated when he strikes the ball, when he pivots on that side, um, and also is sitting. He has a, whole, has a hard time sitting down in class, like it's sitting like here where you're sitting right now. It's bothersome to him. This is how these things typically present. You know, it's, it's insidious onset. It starts to bug them over time. He's still able to play most of the stuff. When you start asking him questions, like, you know, back in high school, I had a bunch of groin strains, hip flexor strains, you know, I've never been as flexible, you know, I always had to come out early to warm up because I could never quite, you know, get my hips moving the way my other teammates could. So this is kind of the picture of the story behind this case here. So when you examine him, you know, he's got limited range of motion on both sides, not just the affected side. And really it's the internal rotation that you start to see this present with. They have a hard time bringing their hip up into flexion and internal rotation because there's a basically a blocked emotion. So he's tender over the hip flexor region, over the groin area. And this test is probably the most uh, non-specific test there is with the FADIR, F-A-D-D-I-R, flexion, adduction, and rotation. When you bring his hip up into flexion and start to push it in, he starts to reproduce that pain. And you always have to ask him that, is this the pain you're experiencing that brings you to see me? Because it's, it's a pretty non-specific test, highly sensitive, but uh, it's, it doesn't really necessarily tell you anything other than you've got an irritable hip joint. Um, Faber, the flexion, abduction, external rotation produces anterior pain for him. He's got basically capsular or some type of intraarticular pain causing, uh, causing with this maneuver here. So when you look at his x-rays, you know, as far as when you shoot x-rays in a non-arthritic hip, you know, an AP pelvis for me is a workhorse for it because you want to be able to see the entire environment with, that you're working with. Um, but really what these tend to show up on these, these, these so-called done laterals or, these, or some type of lateral orthogonal view of the femur. And so we're going to talk about this in more detail here in a second. But what I was going to tell you is that, that basically the trainer came in and said, this is the MRI that he came in with. He's got a complex near full thickness tear in the superior labrum, extending into the anterior superior labrum. So this kid's got a labral tear. And so in his head, he's like, okay, something needs to be done. So that's, that's Fred. I just want to put him, put him out there. That's case number one, okay? This is the second case. This is Danny. And again, these guys came in on successive days to my clinic. Again, both with labral tears, both kind of in their minds think they need the same type of treatment. Well, what I'm trying to explain here is that not all labral tears go down the same, same line. So he also has a three-month history of subtle hip pain. Uh, it's subtle. It's not like, you know, it's not debilitating. It's just kind of subtle. But it's getting, it's getting worse and worse the more he wrestles, the more he, the more he, uh, the more he uh, activates it, okay? With him, his pain is worse with hip extension, worse with external rotation. Almost like the hip itself wants to slide out of the socket. Um, his trainer thinks he's got iliopsoas tendonitis or hip flexor strain. They all have some type of hip flexor strain when they present to me with the labral tear. They always say, oh, it's his hip flexor. We've been dry needling it. We've been massaging it. It's not getting better. And so you always have to think about something underlying that, okay? So his range of motion is very different than Fred, okay? So he's got, you know, great flexion, 130 degrees of hip flexion. His extra rotation is 70, inter rotation is 45 and 40. So it's definitely a, a much more mobile hip. The entire arc of motion on the first patient was 50 degrees of rotation. This guy's got 100, 110, 115 degrees of rotation. So you're looking at a, a different joint, almost a shoulder joint if you think about it, um, just because that arc of motion is, is abnormal, abnormally high. He also has impingement test positives. And so his trainer probably thinks, you know, he's got, he's impinging because he's got this positive veneer, positive favor. But with him, this so-called apprehension test where you drop his leg off the bed, it's almost like applying like a Lachman maneuver to the hip. He has some anterior apprehension or discomfort um, as that hip slides in that position. 
And so here's his pelvis X-ray. Um, and so I think that what you'll see sort of instantaneously is these are two very, very different environments in which this labrum tore. When you look at the, uh, the lateral and the false profile, and what you're looking at is a different hip socket. And so that's kind of the other side of the spectrum. But again, his MRI, if you're reading it, it had no context whatsoever. You'd say, this is the same case, the same patient. This guy's got an anterior superior labral tear with some delamination, you know? And so I think in your mind, if you start thinking that every labral tear is created equal, you're going to find yourself going down the wrong path, okay? So here are two hips side by side. You know, Fred is the soccer player. Danny is a wrestler. Um, but they're like, Doc, what about the labrum tear, right? The labrum, the labrum. And so I think in my clinic, the labrum literally gets all the press. They come in, it's like LeBron James, like the le labrum, the labrum, the labrum. Um, what do I do about the labral tear? So I always explain to them what a labrum is. And, and I think there's misconceptions. And I know your shorter surgeons in the room. Your shoulder's got a labrum too. Very, very different structure. So I'm always trying to explain. It's like a gasket. It's like a seal. I really have, I haven't gotten great at explaining it to patients. I think it's some type of pillow in there. And they think, you know, everyone, everyone's talked to patients. They have different ideas of what it is. All they know is if it's torn, it has to be fixed, right? That's what they always think. But I think it's important for us as medical people to dig a little bit deeper. So um, this is mainly for the students and the residents in the room. Like the labrum is a rim of, it's fibrocartilaginous and it actually lines the entire acetabular rim, okay? And it's contiguous to the TAL at the bottom. So when you guys are doing your hip replacements, and if there's any hip guys in the room, this is what you ream out when you're uh, doing your total hips. I actually like to see it. Um, it's, it. It's actually got a lot of morphology variability, but in general, it's about four to eight millimeters in its overall length um, and it's widest inferiorly. And again, with different morphologies of your hip, you can have a lot of different variations as far as how the labrum actually works inside your joint, okay? But ultimately, it's in, ends up being completely contiguous or continuously articular surface to the point where in some hips, you have a hard time figuring out where the labrum stops, where the articular cartilage starts. Very rich peripheral blood supply, just like the meniscus in the knee, where the blood comes in from the rim and starts to kind of taper out as it gets toward the actual um, edge of it, but it makes it very repairable. It's a structure that likes to be repaired, much like the labrum in the shoulder. However, different in the shoulder, um, this is acting different because it's actually, it, it increases the volume and it also creates an entire seal around the joint, okay? And so what I think is so neat about the hip labrum that um, is it how it manages the hydrodynamics within the hip joint itself. So your joints, every joint in your body, these is separated by a, a layer of synovial fluid, basically a tiny little micro layer of synovial fluid. And the labrum helps to regulate that layer. So as the fluid comes, it, it keeps a, a slight separation between the articular surfaces. What that means though, is when the labrum is dysfunctional, or we have a labral tear or something like that, you lose that balance between the synovial fluid layer. And that's when you start getting things like arthritis. There's no question that labral pathology is the precursor to arthritis. And so um, that's why I think to me, the labrum ends up being so important. It creates this amazing negative pressure inside the hip. Anybody who's ever tried to pop a hip out, even for a total hip or, or um, for any other reason, it creates a pretty tight suction seal. And so you can imagine how important this is for the stability of the joints. So um, I do love this video as far as how hard is it to pull this out. And what you'll find is if you take that labrum out, that suction still goes away. But why does it tear? I guess that's the question. In the shoulder, your labrum tears when you dislocate your shoulder or when you're lifting weights or whatever it might be. In the hip, the labrum ends up being the soft interface between the two bones. And so it's really the interplay between the acetabulum and the femur that causes the labrum to tear, okay? The main ways it tears is either it gets pinched, meaning that the two surfaces will pinch it together, or it shears. And I put this, the picture of the, of the shoes on here because if you have loose fitting shoes, you'll get a blister on your heel. You'll start to damage your, because there's actual toggling there. And that's a, that's a, a really a, an important way the labrum can also tear. Also, it sometimes just wears out. I mean, arthritis is gonna be the end stage for all these joints and, and the labrum can wear out. But there's plenty of literature suggests that labral tears generally occur in the setting of a bony abnormality, whether it be the impingement we'll talk about or dysplasia or some type of bony abnormality. Um, so why does it hurt? This is a very richly innervated structure. It's like the lip in your mouth. And I always, when I'm trying to, when you're talking to patients, you have to try to figure out ways to explain things to them in ways they can understand. I was like, well, if you want to know why your hip labrum hurts, take your lip and put it between your teeth and bite down real hard. That's kind of what's happening inside your hip labrum. And, and all the, the pain fibers are really centralized in the anterior aspect of the hip. Now, these are there for a reason. They give you proprioception. Um, they help you understand where your joint is in space. 
But as you can imagine, when the labrum is torn or unstable like this, and this tissue is getting pinched between the two sides of the joint, it can be pretty darn painful. And so that's what we're trying to figure out how to treat or address these labral tears. Are all torn labrums painful? This is what really gets really hard to understand. Um, Mark Philippon, probably the, the legend of all legends in hip arthroscopy. He, this is my, probably my favorite study. It's from 2012, it's 10 years old. Um, he MRI'd a bunch of asymptomatic volunteers, all about 38, 39 years old. The mean age, I think it was uh, yeah, 38 years old. A 3T MRI and 69% of asymptomatic volunteers had a labral tear or labral signal on their MRI. So it, it probably is a natural history of, of our maturity, if you want to call it that, or aging, that your labrum itself is going to start having some signal within it. So be very careful just assuming all labral tears are the source of pain. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a true believer that people, there's a syndrome in my clinic called total body pain. I heard head to toe. 100% of total body pain patients have labral tears and positive because it's all, it seems to be like my, everything hurts and my labrum is torn. So if you fix that, it'll all get better. It's hard to talk them out of that. Um, so if if you tear your labrum, no MRI, no one MRIs that do you really have a labral tear? That's the question. I always, when you're trying to figure out the algorithm for seeing somebody in clinic, like, yeah, if I want to prove you have a labral tear, I'll get the MRI because I'll probably show one. So the pretest probability is very high with that scenario. So assigning blame for the pain. So I do think it's really important. I'm sure that, you know, the hip arthroscopists in the room utilize this technique. The shoulder, the knee, the exam maneuvers we do for them can be very specific for pathology, right? A lock in the knee, you have ACL tear, you know, an O'Brien or a speed, whatever you want to do in the shoulder, you have a biceps anchor problem. But in the hip, an irritable hip, everything kind of hurts, but also you know, lumbar radiculopathy, bursitis, all these different things can create hip pain. So I do like the idea of doing a guided injection, either with lidocaine or even with steroid, to sort of make sure that the labral tear they have on MRI is their pain generator. Because if you go in there and operate on an asymptomatic labral tear and they have something else going on, it's not going to get better. And then you're going to have a, a, a painful post-op patient who you just didn't do the right thing for. So I utilize an injection in more cases than not to make sure that I know the labrum itself in some of these sort of borderline cases is actually causing the pain. And we have, you do ultrasound right there in the clinic. And it's actually, it can be a eureka moment for some patients. Like this, this hip hurts, this hurts. You do the injection and you, and you do that same for the maneuver. Their pain goes away. It's, it's actually you're like, wow, I cannot believe it. It feels so much better. That's someone who's going to do quite well with a surgical decompression of their FAI. So this is my average hip patient. You know, I don't need x-rays. I have an MRI. I mean, I'm sure you guys all see that. I mean, at the basis of everything we do orthopedically, x-rays end up being at the root of all we, what we do. Um, it's actually a patient gave me this card. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, so I put it on my talk. So this is why x-rays matter. So this is like the Google Maps. And I'm sure you guys have all like put yourself on the street, looked around. Like if I, I, I came here, I have not been to New Brunswick before in my life. And so if I use that, this picture here to get around the city, I would have no idea where I am. The x-ray provides the, the bigger picture, the, the map of the city. So I know where to go. Um, it, it gives you context. And so to kind of put that into the x-ray MRI thing, here you have a labral tear on this hip, but then you look at the x-ray and you see how it is plastic hip. So the x-rays really provide the context of what's going on inside there. Because ultimately it's important to realize that hips really come in all shapes and sizes. Like every, I'm looking at it, like all these different faces in here, your hips are all different too. And so if you treat every hip the same, you're going to find yourself in trouble. At the most basic of it, you have a socket and a ball that you have to work, worry about. The socket can be either shallow or it can be deep. The ball can either be round or it can be aspherical or not round, okay? So I, I've, I don't call these deformities. I typically use the term morphology. This is just how you're shaped, okay? Because plenty of people who have shallow sockets never have a single problem in their entire life. Plenty of people who have uh, cam deformity never have problems in their life. So I don't think it's, it's appropriate for me to say that you're deformed and you're not deformed. So this is just the morphology you're born with and we have to work within that morphology. There ends up being two real ends of the spectrum. On the left side is the too loose. On the right side is the too tight. So um, and in general, too loose is going to be a dysplastic hip and too tight is going to be a, an FAI type hip. And that really ends up being way too simplistic as far as how it actually works because each type of condition has a number of different things that can create it. You also can have things that are happening. We have a too tight and too loose, you know? So it's, these are just different scenarios you're trying to worry about. So I'm gonna just kind of put this, this, this is the two hips. If you can't figure it out, you have the tail of two hips, dysplasia versus FAI. 
on one side, you have the dysplastic hip. On the other side, you have the, 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 FAI hip, the FAI hip. And what you'll realize is these are two very, very different bony morphologies, okay? <clears throat> so on the unstable hip, you have the shear we talked about before. And on the impingement hip, you've got the pinch. So you have the shear and you have the pinch. So talking a bit more about dysplasia, you have a shallow socket. The labrum itself is trying to hold off for dear life as this ball tries to slide out of the socket. And so you get a very classic shear pattern of labral tearing where it actually starts to peel itself directly off the acetabulum. Usually, usually it's a more lateral tear than it is anterior tear because it's an unstable situation. So the tears occur right basically at the base here. And if you, if you look at these x-rays of dysplastic hips and start to have the x-ray talk to you, when, this, when you look at this x-ray and you try to draw a ball inside a socket, what you'll see is you'll see an, a, an upsloping source seal, a ball that's poorly covered, and you can just imagine how this might try to slide out. What the body tends to do in response to this is it's like, okay, I need more coverage here. As you're developing the socket, the ball, they develop together you know, in utero and in, in young kids. If you have a kid with dysplasia, it's got a positive or you know, you, you put them into a harness because you want the, the ball to grow within the socket. What sometimes happens is you have this labral hypertrophy where the labrum itself actually grows larger in order to try to stabilize the hip. Not in all just plastic hips, but more often than not. And what you'll see is you'll see a labrum itself that's trying to take over the bony constraint where there is no bony constraint. However, this creates a very, very um, reproducible uh, instability pattern where the labrum itself can no longer you know, stabilize that joint, okay? So on the other hand, you have this impingement hip, right? And so the term femoroacetabular impingement, or FAI, it's a mouthful, but it's the reason why I think hip arthroscopies exist. It's basically a round whole square peg phenomenon where the hip doesn't really fit. Now, this is a really important time right now because FAI, this is the, the, the article from uh, Reinhold Gons. Now, anybody who has any hip preservation interest whatsoever should go back to this article because this is where the actual term FAI entered our lexicon. So prior to 2003, we really weren't talking about FAI before. We were talking about, I mean, you had cases of skiffy, you had cases of dysplasia. There are some FAI variants that we are, we are aware of. But what Gons and his group did, they looked at cases of idiopathic osteoarthritis in young people. It's like, what's the, what's the common thread? And the common thread for them was this ball and socket mismatch. And that's why we sort of learned about FAI because we actually sort of tried to uh, untangle these early arthritis cases and try to figure out where it came from. So I, I'm sure that uh, Jimmy's got a bottle of scotch in his, in his, in his uh, bar. It probably is as old as FAI can, can vote in December. It's just turned 18. Very exciting. So they describe two main types of FAI. Uh, pincer and cam. That's, that, that was described in the original article. It's just basically putting on two sides of the joint, okay? And this, it's gotten a lot more complex since then, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. The real key, though, is that pincer is going to be a low clearance in the front. So it's like this truck trying to get to this bridge where you actually can't, you can't clear the joint because the rim hangs too low. So I made these sort of PowerPoint sort of figures to try to explain it a little bit. When you have that low-hanging front, as your hip comes into flexion, as you're sitting here right now, 9,800 degrees of flexion, you start to engage the anterior uh, rim and you get this classic pattern of labral damage, femoral neck damage, and usually a contra Q injury in the back of the joint because actually literally there's a fulcrum there in the front. The labrum just gets crushed as you can see with that red, the red mark on that labrum and the, the hip itself can actually lever outside the joint. So that's kind of the classic pincer mechanism. We realized this video didn't play before, but sometimes it pinches so much, the labrum itself just starts turning to bone, it ossifies. Um, and it is a metaplasia of the actual tissue. That's just basically chronic pinching over years and years and years. That's why labral tears didn't happen yesterday. It happens over the course of years and years. Um, the cam is, is probably, I think, one that's it, it's, it's probably more, in my mind, damaging to the joint because what the cam does is it starts to damage the cartilage first, okay? So the terminology cam, you're like looking at this gif of a, of a duck. This is the best way I can explain how cam works, okay? It's an out of round femur where the radius of curvature changes as the hip goes into flexion. So the deeper you go into flexion, it starts to engage the joint. And this duck, it just lifts the, uh, the, the wing up and down. But inside a joint, that cam deformity actually can create a fulcrum, a lever, and, and pivot the entire hip out of the joint. You can imagine over time, that interface becomes problematic. So this is a, a simplistic idea of how it goes. You have an area of the, of the ball that's not really round. As you come into flexion, it actually lifts the labrum up and starts to peel the cartilage back. And as it peels the cartilage back, it delaminates it. 
and it creates a pattern of cartilage damage that's that's problematic because you get sheets of cartilage torn off the bone. Okay, the problem is this happens in young people. This is like eight, this this case right here is an eighteen year old baseball player who's getting full thing as cartilage leaks because of this thing. The other thing is cartilage is aneural, has got no sensation to it. So you can start ripping cartilage off your joint and not feel it. And so they call this a silent killer of the hip. Um, and I think it's a leading cause of hip osteoarthritis because look, this is a, a 22 year old kid and you can see how his labrum is peeled back. And then as you lift underneath the labrum, he's got exposed bone because that cam deformity over time has started to peel that cartilage back. And so you can imagine how this just destroys the joint. And so in the whole world of hip preservation, this is what we're trying to figure out how to address. The total joint guys are really, yeah, I can't wait to replace that joint. This guy's 22, you know, so it's not going to be ready for that anytime soon. So, um, so looking at dysplasia versus impingement, both of these scenarios lead to arthritis because you've got joint loading is abnormal. The cartilage itself can no longer overcome the forces. And over time, you get this classic pattern of, of arthritis. And so anybody in the total joint service, can, you'll start to see these patterns in, in joint clinic, like, oh, this guy is shallow. This guy's got a cam. That's why these have gone on to these osteoarthritic position, these conditions, okay? So the next part of this talk is going to be about trying to look at these x-rays, okay? Trying to figure out how do you look at x-rays of the non-arthritic hip um, and realize that there's ways to, to look at hips in different ways. I like that cartoon. It was pretty good. Um, so I sent this email to Joe Mar. This is an article that came out. John Clovis wrote this back in 2008. Um, which I really think is a good article as far as how do you how do you have an algorithm for examining a hip x-ray, okay? So my standard series is three x-rays. I always get AP pelvis because, I, again, I like to see the entire pelvis. I always get a bilateral done lateral because I like to see both sides. This is usually a bilateral problem. Then in a false profile, look to cover it, make sure they're not dysplastic in the front or overcovered or have a subspine deformity, okay? So these are my, my basic series. I get on every single, every single patient. Um, so when you look at the AP pelvis, you want to make sure it's rotated right. It's very easy for a malrotated x-ray to give you bad lines, okay? What I mean by that is if you tilt the x-ray forward, you can make a, the rim hang way anterior if, you need, if, if, if the x-ray is in the wrong position, and you can, mis, you can misdiagnose somebody. Um, so you're looking for the anterior rim and the posterior rim. That's always the easiest thing to do, and if, if we want to go through x-rays in more detail later, I can certainly show you how I pick those out. We want to see how they, how, they, how they interface with each other. You're trying to look at a cup in a 3D cup and 2D. And you're trying to figure out how that cup is oriented, both, you know, is it anterverted or retroverted, how deep it is, you know, is it upsloping? Do you have a tonus angle that's too high? Um, the source seal is the weight-bearing dome. It means eyebrow in France, in French. It's the, it's the actual weight-bearing dome. How much of the source seal is covering the head? How is, it, is the source seal uh, uh, oriented? You can always pick up the spine. So the anterior inferior spine is directly uh, anterior to the hip joint or a little proximal to the hip joint where the rectus comes off of. And you can usually find the ischial spine too. And all these different things give you a kind of a clues to kind of how that hip joint is oriented in, um, in the, in the uh, both the coronal plane and the sagittal plane in the axial. So the angles, we, the, the one angle you always have to be aware of is this lateral center edge angle of Weiber. The reason why is because this is your, your, your go-to for lateral coverage, okay? So the most basic screening test for dysplasia is a low center edge angle. So a normal center edge angle between 25 and 40, if you're starting to get in that 25 to 20 range, you really gotta start looking at that socket critically for dysplasia. And what that means is if, if the socket's too shallow and you don't have coverage of your head, that's gonna be that scenario where the ball is not well uh, founded within that socket. The second one I think is really important is so-called tonus angle. Now this hip's pretty normal, normally shaped hip. The tonus angle shows you the, the inclination of that, of that source seal, uh, the acetabular index. You're trying to get a sense of, of how the actual roof of this joint is holding the ball in the socket. So those two numbers are a great screening tool for dysplasia. The crossover sign that we look for is where the anterior wall um, is projected more distally than the posterior wall. Now would indicate you have some type of retroversion, either a cephalad retroversion where the, the top of the socket is, is, is curved, or even you can have global retroversion. In this scenario here, like this x-ray here is a really terrifying x-ray to me because it looks like a deep hip that's well covered. But if you start looking at it, you realize the posterior wall is, is, is way um, medial to the interior wall. And you realize the center of rotation is not really covered by either wall. And this is actually a pretty dysplastic hip. That if you treat this hip arthroscopically with some type of pincer resection or something like that, you're gonna basically introduce an iatrogenic dysplasia to this case, it's gonna be a problem. And so a case like this, you're like, oh, this is a great hip arthroscopy case. It actually probably isn't. It's probably better suited for a PAO. 
So um, as far as the, the parameters, I always like to have these sort of like these, these, these slides that kind of show everything you're looking for to make sure you understand kind of how the socket is. This is kind of things that memorize if you want to look at this in more detail. Um, dysplasia is really what you're trying to, to make sure you don't miss. So in your hip preservation clinic, if you are a hip arthroscopist and you're, and you're scooping a bunch of dysplastic hips, you have a lot of unhappy patients because they do quite poorly after arthroscopic surgery. And even worse, a failed arthroscopic surgery in a dysplastic patient does worse after a PAO. So it's, it's always, in my clinic, I'm always trying to make sure I understand the socket orientation. So this is an example of a dysplastic hip where you have a low center edge angle, you have a high tennis angle, somebody who's going to be an instability case, and you know that hip's holding on for dear life. This definitely has a labral tear, by the way. And the patient definitely wants a, the minimally invasive arthroscopy. But you're going to end up cutting this person's belief from a ligament, and you're going to make them worse. So just be, make sure you recognize this. So orthogonal views end up being really important. I know you guys probably seen this on the internet somewhere, but um, it's important to be able to see both sides of, of the story. So for me, my orthogonal view of the femur is just done lateral. So um, you're going to ask why done lateral. I'll tell you here in a second. What you're looking for here in the done lateral is you're looking for the overall shape of the proximal femur. You're looking for any reactive bone that's forming on the femur where there might be some rubbing that's occurring. Sometimes you'll actually get like a reactive bump or even you have loss of offset. So that's where you're trying to sort of find these done laterals, okay? So why a done versus a frog? So a done is classically the elongated view of the femur where you actually can see the entire femoral neck. This is the same patient, the frog versus a done. And for me, as I'm trying to reestablish offset, I like to utilize the second picture so I can actually see what I've done surgically and make sure I know kind of what I'm trying to attack. So, um, so as far as localizing the bump, in general, most of these femoral deformities for FAI, it's going to be kind of the anterior lateral aspect of femoral head neck junction. So great CT study that, uh, that uh, Jim Ross did looking kind of where the bump is. The 45 degree done lateral kind of gives you that 130 o'clock position on the femoral neck, which is going to be kind of your, it's going to basically be the highest area uh, of incidents for cam deformities. So that's why I get a 45 degree done, okay? <clears throat> so, so as far as characterizing the bump, you're trying to figure out where the head loses its sphericity, right? So we talked about the cam mechanism. You have a radius of curvature of that femoral head that is constant throughout a certain arc of motion, but as soon as it gets too long, um, in that red area, it will start to engage the femoral, the joint, okay? So you're looking for loss of offset. You're looking for bony remodeling, the so-called dromedary sign that someone named because it looks like a camel hump. Um, <clears throat> the key radiographic indicator we use is called an alpha angle. An alpha angle is something that insurance likes. It's hard to get this exactly for interobservable reliability. It's not always the easiest thing to do. We're looking to see where objectively the ball becomes aspherical. And so you draw an angle down the middle of the femoral neck, then where the ball loses sphericity, and that's the so-called alpha angle. Uh, greater than 55 is considered to be a cam, cam morphology or cam deformity, okay? It's important to realize that cams come in, in all shapes and sizes. Uh, you can have some that are just simple loss of headache offset, right? Or you can have some very large bumps, you know? So it's important when you're looking at these proximal femoral morph morphology, there's a, a variety of different ways you can look at it, okay? This is, this is an example of what I'd call inadequate head neck offset, where basically the ball never rounds itself out. It's not like a bump, it just never becomes round. Whereas this one here is gonna be a more prominent bump. You guys can kind of get a sense of where the neck should be versus where the neck actually is. And you can just imagine your head what that red area does when that person goes into flexion. If you see a cam on the AP X-ray, you're looking probably at a posterior lateral cam. So be aware that it can also go around the back. So again, I basically stare at x-rays all day long, trying to figure out how that x-ray is causing the symptoms that the patient is looking at. As you, can, as you might notice, you know, MRI for me is pretty secondary. I, I don't necessarily need MRIs to tell me what to do. The majority of these will have a labral tear. The MRI for me is twofold. One, I want to look at the, the health of the cartilage, make sure there's no subchondral cystic changes or, um, or other things like red hair, you know, things outside the joint, you know, PVNS or things like that. Um, but also insurance usually requires an MRI before they authorize any type of arthroscopic surgery, which I think is kind of silly, but that's how it is. So getting back to the two hips we talked about before. So if you look at, again, the MRI reads, you have the same case, right? But when you look at the actual x-rays, you realize that it's not exactly the same case. So this is Fred. So we, I was going to go through his extra parameters here. So he's got um, basically a pretty, a pretty lo a loss of head neck offset here where he's obviously going to be impinging here. And I, I bet you people in the room, like, that's not that impressive. That's, that's, you know, that's not a very large cam deformity. 
which is fine. But when you start looking at it under x-ray and then looking under arthroscopy, you realize what this kid's doing to himself. This kid's a 20-year-old soccer player who's peeling these large areas of cartilage off his bone. And you can see when you actually start examining this, this is why this guy's hip hurts. And there's a couple of things you can see here. One, you can see the red bruising of the labrum. You can see the delamination. So you have a mixed type FAI pattern here. Um, whenever you're inside the joint, you're trying to figure out in your mind what's causing this pathology that I'm seeing. When you see that bruising of the labrum, you, you realize the labrum itself is getting crushed. When you see that delamination of the cartilage, you realize the labrum, the, 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 the cam deformity is causing that issue too. So that's the bruise, and that's behind the bruise. You can see that this so called pincer deformity. This is what acetabuloplasty looks like. We're going to shave away that deformity to get the labrum a more stable base. And you can do a lot of good inside the joint as far as trying to get the cartilage removed, stabilize that labrum, and, make, and give them basically a better interface. Okay. So I would, I would think that the seal that's going to be created by this labral, this labrum would be much better than the seal that's created by the torn labrum. So as you put the ball back into the socket, which I think I do right here, you can kind of see how the seal is reestablished. Okay. You're trying to get a nice, basically covers the entire femoral head um, and recreate that seal. But for him, it, where his big problem was, was actually on the femur. And so we use a lot of fluoro in order to ide identify exactly where the deformity is. It doesn't always look all that impressive under, um, sometimes you'll see a big bump there. You'll see cartilage you know, getting grinded off. But clearly that's where his problem is going to be. And so over time, he basically, and this is where hip arthrosity probably gets a bad rap. We spend a lot of time burning femur. Um, so the femur, it's like doing the chromioplasty, except you have to do it in three dimensions. And it's actually, and your visualization is always, always that good. Um, you're trying to recreate a round, basically a round ball out of a, out of a football. So it can be kind of challenging to do that. But as you can imagine, you, you know, restoring a round femur is going to give this guy a lot better chance of having a joint skill last as long as he lasts. Okay? So here's sort of a before and after. And you can kind of get a sense when you're looking at the at the, at the lines, the lines have been corrected and the femur's been corrected. And so you do feel pretty good about this joint. So this guy actually got back to playing full soccer. He played every game the following season and his, his symptoms got improved. I don't know if this is going to play or not. This is one of my favorite videos. It might be loud, so hopefully the, the volume's not too high. This guy scored a goal from like 60 yards out. It was like a must-see moment. I'll show it to you later off the side. So we're going to get back to Danny. So Danny's our dysplastic hip, as we know. So Danny's our wrestler, okay? So what you'll see when you look at the morphology of this guy's hip is you see a hip that's just not covering it well, and you see a sore seal that's upsloping. And I just kind of drew in what the labrum probably looks like in this guy's scenario. That labrum itself is trying to hold on for dear life. So that's why it's apprehensive. When you, when you start pushing the hip out from behind, there's nothing that's blocking the anterior uh, instability. So, um, so with him, Hip arthroscopy is not really necessarily the, the, what you want to do. So this is what a periastabular osteotomy looks like. So also described by Gans. Um, you're trying to basically rotate the socket over the, over the ball to reorient the socket so it's more stable. Um, in this case, he also had a cam we took down. Um, but as you can see, it's, a, it's, it's also called a triple osteotomy. Or you, you cut the pelvis in three different places in order to be able to rotate the entire socket over top of the head. Now, what this does, it normalizes his anatomy. So what you'll see once you, once you take the hardware out, he basically has a much more normal shape to his sore seal into his femoral head neck junction. So you can see his before and after picture of how, how it's covered. The sore seal is now flatter. It it's extends more laterally over the femoral head neck junction. So, um, so this kid is actually a, is a true success story. He actually redshirted after the surgery, but got back to wrestling in 10 months. And he actually won the ACC player, uh, Wrestler of the Year the year following his PAO. And so I use this case just to kind of, you know, because it's a terror. This is a terrifying surgery to explain to somebody. I'm going to cut your pelvis in three places and put screws in it. I mean, but you're changing the actual natural history of their joint. And so this guy was heading toward, you know, it might not have been wrestling at UVA. It might have been when he was 25 or 26. I mean, he might, he was going to go, it was going to go south. And so you feel pretty good about reorienting his joint. So, um, so that, that I just want you to realize even though they came with labral tears, these are two just very, very different hips, okay? And just kind of as a, as a summary of, of what we're going to be looking at here, in FAI, you typically see it more in males and females, and it's all the pivoting sports, so ice hockey, lacrosse, soccer. Um, they'll have reduced range of motion, so when you're examining them, their hip doesn't move very well. And when you're, when you're, you're talking to them, like, oh, I'm not flexible. You know, I always say you're not a ballerina, or you're not a dancer, because your hips just don't open up at all. Um, 
their pain will be localizable to the groin, sometimes in the buttock, but normally the groin. Their labor is getting crushed. That's where the pathology comes from. The labrum, their crawlers gets crushed. Um, the, the, the way to treat it, you have to correct the impingement. Um, and I use a hip scope for it. I mean, historically, we used to do surgical hip dislocations. We did many open, but really, I think the mainstay for, for correcting FAI right now is in hip arthroscopy. Um, because I think we do as good a job as you do with any type of hip procedure. Has anybody ever seen a surgical hip dislocation? You usually pop the entire hip out of a socket. But it's a pretty large surgery. You're taking down the abductors. And it can be a pretty big, uh, pretty big whack. The hip scope, I think, is, is equivalent. Um, and it's much less invasive. As far as dysplasia, I certainly see it more in females than males. You typically see it in the higher range of motion uh, um, sports or activities. In fact, I think dysplasia probably selects for dancers. I mean, if you, if you uh, have shallow hips, you can do the splits at age eight. You, you might have dysplasia, but you also can be probably a pretty good dancer. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if having loose hips kind of, I, I could never be a ballet dancer because my hips just don't do that. Um, so I do think you're going to have a higher incidence of, of dysplasia in these cases just in general. Um, they have high range of motion, usually excessive range of motion. Um, and sometimes they also have concomitant soft tissue laxity too. So you always want to do like a bait and criteria score on them and make sure that you're not dealing with a double whammy, which is a shallow hip and a loose hip. Um, flexible, again, flexible. They're also going to have groin pain. They're going to have fatigue positive. They're going to have apprehension too. They're going to have a hip that feels loose to them and they get uncomfortable in certain positions, especially external rotation. They're able to get sheared, right? And so in order to fix that, you got to correct their instability. So um, and the way you do that is for osteotomy. So that's, that's the end of my story. Um, I want to just let you guys know about UVA orthopedics. So we're down in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, there's 26 surgeons who work there. We just built this brand new UVA hospital um, that we're moving into in 2000, hopefully 2022, if, we, if, we, if it gets finished in time. Um, there's five sports surgeons. I'm the only hip guy. Uh, but it's a great place. Uh, I've been there for 10 years now, or nine years now. It's, it's a fabulous place to, to practice. So. I gotta give a shout out to my program. So I'm here for any questions you guys might have. I have I can talk hip literally all day long. Um, so be careful about asking questions. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Study. Um, how do you integrate that idea of non treatment? So, non op treatment, I think, is, the main, is, is that's where they all start. I mean, they all start non op treatment. And, and honestly, in adolescence, you know, they get a little bit of hip pain, they get x ray FAI. I mean, yeah, they're going to have FAI. And so you have to realize in the back of your mind, I, I, I can go into the demographic studies we've done in the past as far as like what the true incidence of FAI is in the world, right? And like high school soccer players, I think 67% have FAI morphology at baseline, right? So if you if all those guys got a thermoplasty, one, I'd be super busy, but two, you'd be doing like a ton of unnecessary surgery. And so I think that almost every single case requires, and, and insurance will require this too, at least some type of non-operative treatment. And what you're describing is, is, so FAI is not just, it can also be very dynamic, meaning that how your pelvis sits in space, how your core muscles, how your glutes all work, it can contribute to this concept of FAI. And also look at how everyone sits in, in like this all day long. They get these tight hip flexors, they get these you know, weakened hamstrings, these weakened posterior connect chain. So can you, can you fix somebody non-operatively by trying to address these kinetic problems they have within their skeleton? And so I certainly, everybody that I see, especially adolescents, undergoes some trial of non-operative treatment. And a lot of them either, it just starts to fade away, it gets better, um, or, or it declares itself. When it declares itself, you realize they're in trouble and their hips getting in trouble. They have that delamination. Except like, the last thing I wanna do is not up everybody and, and, and miss a bunch of delaminated hips. You know? So it's always kind of a balancing act. So FAI will declare itself after three or four months, whether it's gonna go in a good direction or a bad direction. Um, but I will say that, um, I, I try to de-emphasize their deformity when I'm talking to them. I see this x-ray. They read about cam deformity. They're like, I, doc, I'm not going to play college football because I have this cam in my hip. And I try to de-emphasize the fact it's deformity. That's why I make sure I never use that term. So this is how you're shaped. You're a big football player. A lot of kids have this, exactly the same shape. 95% never require any type of intervention other than some, some therapy, some time, anti-inflammatories, and they just 
they go live their life and they've avoided surgery because the last thing you want to do is have people who do not everybody does great after surgery you know like so you don't want to have a bunch of people who who you did an unnecessary surgery on and then they don't do as well as they would have if you done that treatment so connect is really interesting because you know they, we, we we reviewed it in our journal club and all my guys looking at me like oh my god you shouldn't be doing fbi surgery i'm like well that's not exactly the conclusions he came to. He just says that at least some patients re respond well to non-op treatment. So I, I typically do use it a lot. Yeah. Um, I, uh, so I, I do a lot of CT, and I'll, I'll print CTs up, so this is a CT I printed up, um, and I'll, I'll hang that around here in a second, this is the FBI CT, um, but CT, I think there's much more than just a socket and a ball, there's, there's your version, both the version of the socket, there's a version of your femoral neck, the version, I mean, there's some people who have, you know, the McKibben index is a combined version between your acetabulum and your, and your, and your femur. And if you've got somebody with 45 degrees of, of combined antiversion, that person can be really terrible at the scope because they're clearly in a, a dysplastic case. So how do you realize, how do you recognize or identify that? So <clears throat> I'll get CT scans, look at version on anybody who's like, there's some that are just pretty straightforward. Like that soccer kid, very straightforward. He had a very straightforward exam. These weird ones, I always get CT scans just to kind of evaluate the 3D anatomy in more detail to make sure I'm not doing the wrong thing. But I don't do PA. So I, what you realize is that like, you know, I'm a, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hip arthroscopist. And so I need to be able to recognize dysplasia, but like the nuances of how to treat dysplasia, like you described introverting osteotomy for somebody who's got, you know, it's probably you know, total retroversion or, 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 you know, it's a different way to treat pincer and pincer. You can go in there and trim the rim, but you've got a posterior wall deficiency or you can actually, you know, change the orientation of that, of that socket to make it more introverted. Um, those nuances can be challenging for me to figure out exactly what to do. However, we have, I have a, I wouldn't say I'm a partner, but somebody down the road who does those with me uh, or for me. And um, it's really nice to learn about how he approaches it using the CT scans as well. But this is a, uh, this is a hip that I, I uh, my student actually printed up a CT scan. And this is actually before and after hip arthroscopy. And so I'll hang this around, you guys can see. But you guys can get a sense of how the actual opinion actually works inside the hip joint, both before surgery and then after you've corrected it. So I've also, I've also printed up a lot of CT scans as well. <clears throat> any, any other questions? Yes. It's funny, the, the loose hips, by far the easiest hips to operate on because it's like you're driving in like, it's like wide open. You're like, oh, I can do whatever I want to in here, you know? But they're the ones who end up doing the worst because their pathology probably comes from their distractibility. So there's two ways. In, in my mind, I've got two ends of the spectrum. Like, why are they loose? They lose because their labrum is incompetent. And they don't create a suction seal. Or they lose because they've got hyperlaxity. And they've got basically, I mean, you know, if you have somebody who's got, you know, eight out of nine bane criteria, they're going to be a pretty loose hip too. And so I do worry a lot about my capsular management. And one thing we didn't talk about is, is the hip joint capsule. So the biggest ligament in the pelvis is going to be the ligament. And that's what connects basically your, your, the anterior, you know, pelvis to your femoral neck. And in order to do hip arthroscopy, we have to violate that ligament somehow, we either make poke holes in it, or we cut all the way through it. And so in that scenario you're describing um, with somebody who's got a loose hip, that capsule is basically like, I, I like I do the cash slot. I mean, my fellow doesn't even touch it. I, my two edges, I keep nice and clean. And I'm going to actually over sew that cap slot, that cap slot. I mean, it's sort of like uh, the pants are a vest. They sort of, sort of keep it tight or tighten it up somewhat. Make sure the label seals as good as I can possibly make it. 
Ironically, the tight hips, the harder ones to do, actually end up doing a lot better, at least from my clinical practice. Like I'm, the harder the hip is, the better they're going to do. And like, I don't understand kind of why, but I think it's because it's easier to correct a or decompress a hip than it is to tighten up a hip. I've never been super confident that actually sewing over sewing a capsule is going to be a permanent fix, you know? And that's why I think PAOs in those scenarios, even in a relatively normally shaped hip, might be what they probably need. So I, I get nervous when I, I'll put somebody on the table, shoot my first extra, the hip's already out. I'm like, oh God, this could be tough. This could be tough. Well, it'll be easy, but it'd be a tough patient. But um, so distractibility, the other thing pop me out, my, if you guys want to keep listening to hips, my next talk is on the technical aspects of hip arthroscopy. But um, you got to pull the hip out of the socket. So there's a reason why hip arthroscopy took a long time to become adopted, right? The shoulder and the knee are super, relatively superficial joints. It's not that hard to get into them. In order to get into the hip, you actually have to just look or distract the hip, pull out of the socket. And it's pretty darn deep using a 70 degree scope the whole time. So it's a challenging procedure to do. Um, and then to actually accomplish what you're trying to accomplish with some of these hips, it can be really technically very hard. So, um, so we can talk about that in, uh, in the next talk as far as the actual, how you do it. But um, it used to be, we'd put everybody, you guys all see a fracture table where you have a, you know, your feet in some type of boot and you got a post and so start in the hip, you start cranking the, cranking the boot until the, the hip pops out of the socket. And so some come out more easily than others. Now, Dr. Buckley and I, we use a post-free table. We actually just use you know, a little traction, a little bit of Trendelenburg and you want to the hip out that way, but it's uh, all different ways to get into the hip. I do worry about those easy to distract hips, but you worry about them orthopedically no matter what. They're the ones who got MDI at the shoulder, they have you know, ankle instability. And so you're wondering, can a soft tissue procedure fix that person? And probably, probably not. Yeah, you pull those stitches in. When I was with Thomas Bird, so I trained with Thomas Bird. He was a capsulectomy guy. So we just ripped the capsule apart and have a wide open view. Toward the end of my, we, we, would, we would repair maybe one out of every six capsules with like a couple of microls. And he'd always, you know, Thomas Bird, he's, a, he's from Nashville, Tennessee. He talks like a, Real Southern gentleman, like, I don't know. I bet you these will rip out before he even gets to pack you. And I'm like, yeah, probably. He's just, he does it. He said he was doing it back then just so he could go on the podium and show that he closes capsule. But now closing capsule is pretty much standard of care. The seal is like understandable. Like, can I create that seal again? The capsule. The capsule is what keeps me up at night. I can tell you that. Labor is easy. The, the capsule is the hard thing. Yeah, yeah, you, don't, you don't close capsule? I don't. Yeah. 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 Of course. You also you have a much more powerful tool by redirecting that femur. Putting three vicral stitches into a capsule is not a very powerful tool. So, but I do like the idea of, of closing what I opened. So it's just kind of a, a courtesy. But I, I also think there's some, some value in doing it. Uh, I found that some patients of mine who weren't doing as well after surgery that I want them to, you get a post-operative MRI. They have a capsular opening or dehiscence or something like that. You don't know how many. What I want to know is how many capsules and people who are asymptomatic didn't heal. You know, So is it possible that a capsule not healing is still not a problem. So, but it does keep me up at night. Hips, hips are, you gotta be really careful with your indications because there's a subset of hip patients just no matter what you do, they're not gonna get better. And so if you operate on those, you're gonna be pretty discouraged in your clinical practice. I think it's, that, that kind of goes for everything. Anything else? Thanks. Thanks, man. Who would do that, Jamar? Just, just keep standing here. Is it interpretive dance time? I have a quick remote question if you have a moment. Yes, please. Go ahead. First of all, it was a great talk. Thank you very much. My name is Steve Adolph, and I work with Tom McPartland there, who's in the uh, audience. I'm one of the other uh, pediatric uh, orthopedists. Um, <laughs> so my question uh, is, I guess, on natural history. So it seems like there's uh, two indications to, uh, to address these hips. One is for pain. Uh, and symptoms, which is typically what drives us when these are kind of younger patients. And then the second indication for operating on these uh, patients is to alter natural history. 
Um, so what is your take or kind of opinion on how are we doing? How are we doing with altering the natural history? What's the best, uh, what's the best kind of literature or kind of stuff we have out there just on, you know, telling patients how we're doing on altering their natural history and their need for something later on when they get older? I, I wish I knew the exact answer to that. I think, I think intuitively it makes sense that if you're changing the, the anatomy. So I guess to answer your question first is like, do you ever want to do like a prophylactic, you know, someone who's, who's less symptomatic because it makes sense to try to correct their anatomy. And I would say symptoms, what drives kind of like, in my opinion, what drives uh, my algorithm. So there are some people who have bilateral cams or symptomatic on one side. You fix that side, they want the other side fixed just to avoid that in the future. I have a hard time believing that my surgery is going to help an asymptomatic hip. I don't think it's going to avoid whatever. I think the pain is probably our best guide that problems are occurring. You know, you're not going to rip your hip apart without knowing it. So I, I, I would never probably do a prophylactic hip scope just to try to improve the natural history. The second part of that question is whether or not we're actually are improving the natural history. And sadly, you know, hip arthroscopy FAI is only, you know, 10, 15 years old. And so I don't think we have the long-term studies yet, but you're looking at outcome studies from Mark Philippon, from Thomas Bird. They're 10 years out from hip arthroscopy. And in the presence of labral tears with corrected FAI who had, you know, greater than two millimeter joint space at the time of arthroscopy, those patients are doing better than those who, uh, who you know, are doing better. So I do think there is some value in what we do. And just intuitively to me, seeing what the cam deformity can do to the cartilage, changing that I think does help. The same way HCO in the knee can help off with the medial compartment, the same way, you know, a lot of these different things we do can help patients out in the long term. I do think hip arthroscopy or FAI correction is helping them. The same way PAOs help, you know, to change the natural history. Yeah. Yeah. That answer is important, but giving someone good function in their 20s is more physical. So exactly. In a lot of ways, this question doesn't matter. Yeah, I think it will bear out over time for sure. But I do think that you're saying they're symptom free after five, six, seven years. You certainly have changed something for the positive. And they're able to participate in your sports. And, and I mean, I've, I've been, I mean, my, uh, it's kind of funny, my, this was, my first hip scope in practice was a guy uh, I did 2013, October 2013. I was terrified. I just got into practice. Um, this is a marathon, like a, like a long distance runner guy that my partners had teed up for me. So I basically got a fellowship. I meet this guy. He's like my second patient I ever met in my entire life and sent him for a hip scope. And I was like, oh, when, when, are you, when are you, is your next opening? I'm like, tomorrow? Like, I, 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 this is like my first day in clinic. I, and like, how do you tell your first patient you're going to do surgery on them? That's a good question for the resident, the chief residents out there. Like, what are you going to tell your first patient you replace your shoulder? Like, oh, how many of these have you done, doc? You're like, I don't know. Like, uh, it's a good question, you know? Like, so, uh, so I think one of my fellows last year told me a good answer. He goes, you'd be surprised how many of these I've done, you know? So <laughs> usually you don't, you don't get a second question after that. Like, you'd be I've done zero. You'll be number one. Anyhow, my first one nine years ago, uh, his name is Chris. Um, I took like 78 photographs and had like six minutes of fluoro time. And it was like, I went and I, I was like, I was so worried about this case. Nine years later, the guy's running marathons. Like not, and this is like my first case ever. I should have just quit then. But um, so, uh, so I do think it does actually help the natural history because he was not able to even do anything before I operated on him. I wish he all did that well. Um, Yeah. Okay, the question is see where I can. Yeah, how did the camp form? You know, so there's two, it's genetic. I mean, clearly, if your dad, you know, or your mom has a camp deformity or have a higher propensity for it. 
but we think that a lot of it's athletic activity during your adolescence. The same way I try to describe like a, like an Oshkosh slaughter type thing in your knee. You, know, you grow a bump because you're doing a lot of activities. So the, the physis of the proximal femur from the ages of 12 and 16 is probably going to be an area where you can have this kind of recurrent. I and mean, even I think it might be, you know, everyone knows what a slip cap from epiphysis is. That's the actual true fracture there. But is there some stress occurring that epiphyseal area where you're laying out extra bone in metaphysis? And that's kind of why these cams may or may not form. So um, the, the Swiss data is interesting because they're looking at basketball players, they've looked at hockey players, they've looked at football, looked at hockey players, and they follow them over time. They're seeing these guys who are high level athletes that their adolescence had a higher propensity for developing cam lesions. And, but I mean, at the same time, I still have my kid playing sports. I mean, I'm not going to stop him from playing sports with what a cam, but is there any way we can alter the actual natural history preemptively, put me out of a job? So it's always funny when we, we do these things, we're trying to prevent ACLs or, you know, ever like, we're all be non-op if we do it. If we do a really good job, we're all going to end up being non-op. Surgery is fun. Yeah. Yes, he has. So Kay Jones is a nurse, and I, actually, I've looked at with him. I've done three or four papers, not on those first set, set of patients, but if you look at his first case, so Bird, Thomas Bird is like, he's one of my close, he's a great mentor to me. His first ever case he presents, when he presents like his history of arthroscopy, is for loose bodies and a football player and a grossly dysplastic hip. I mean, it's a, it's a really shallow hip. Like, I was like, wow, he's, he's scooped that. We had no idea. So, that patient did quite well, but if you look inside the joint, you can see there's a joint that was breaking down. But his whole goal there was that those 1992 or 93, he was just to get the loose bodies out. He, for 12 years, he did hip scopes without the concept of FAI. Like he had no idea what FAI it didn't exist. It was, we knew about skiffies, we knew about some of these deformities, but FAI is a, is a, is a diagnosis that didn't really exist. And so he was debriding labrums, he was doing capsulectomies. And people were doing reasonably well, but I guess they had, they had no comparisons group of people who, who, you know, were not, you know, were pay, whatever it might have been. So when you look back at his data, like 15, 20 years later, a lot of those patients who had any type of cartilage damage did poorly, it had to go on until hip arthroplasty. So um, he did have a series of patients that didn't do as well. But yeah, I mean, 2003, 2004, he actually went over and hung out with uh, Michael Deans, uh, learned about the peripheral compartment. So in the hip, they have two compartments. You have the central compartment, which is where the labrum and the cartilage the acetabulum is, the peripheral compartment. You know, for 15 years, he didn't go, the peripheral compartment didn't exist to him. He wouldn't even go out there, except to grab loose bodies out of the, out of the, out of the gutters. So shaving on a femur didn't occur to him until like 2004, 2005. So it's pretty crazy to, to talk about. Yeah. 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 A lot of hip replacements in that group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the one thing that the key point. Yeah, you can fix a labor, but you don't fix the reason why labor tour is going to be doomed for failure again. So, but I mean, even repairs the labor, he wasn't doing even doing repairs for the first 15 years. He was just debriding it and just trying to, and you do labrectomies, people do fine. The same way you do meniscectomies. It's kind of fun. Funny, the hip is like 20 years behind all the other stuff, like you know, microfracture, you know, even thermal capsulography we're doing as recently as five years ago in the hip, trying to tighten up hips. And, that in the shoulder became a disaster. And so the hip, I think, is not really indicated either. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's uh, interesting to hear him talk about it because, you know, it, it, his evolution has been really kind of cool. You know, he's getting a little bit up there. He's been doing it for 30 years now. So he's got a lot of stories that he can tell. Um, but in general, he's like, yeah, they all did they all did pretty good, but he had no basis for comparison. And he didn't, he was not a capsule closure guy either for, for and he's closing capsule now, um, but.
for a while. We, I mean, when I was a fellow, and this is, we would we would just basically take the entire capsule out and be looking at the proximal femur like it was amazing the view. And, and now I try to like make tiny little slits and or a T cut or whatever it might be. Cool, man. Thanks, Jen. All right.